Hey, good afternoon, everybody in Hawaii. A good day to our viewers around the world. This is uh, Steve Zerker. I'm the host of a webcast to run on Think Tech Hawaii um, called Looking to the East. So we uh, take a look at various issues related to Japan and Asia. Uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, on our show, we looked at uh, baseball. Uh, in Japan uh, with a couple of uh, journalists that are working on that. And now we're going to address a much more serious issue uh, having to do with the state of mental health in Japan. So that's the topic for our show today. And we're very fortunate to have a colleague and friend of mine, Dr. Reggie Paul with us today. Uh, Reggie is a practicing clinical psychotherapist in private practice. He's also been a teacher and instructor of cross-cultural psychology over the years here in Japan. He even uh, taught for three years in Thailand at uh, Assumption University. If you have not heard of that school, it's one of the best schools in Thailand. So Reggie has a very interesting background in psychotherapy, both in private practice and also in instructing. Uh, the topic as well. So Reggie, good morning to you here in Japan. Thank you so much for joining my show so early in the morning. Thank I you, really Steve. appreciate it. Good morning. Yep. So what prompted this uh, show topic in my mind, um, part of it's my own personal experience and teaching uh, over the last year or so, my senses and when I talk to my colleagues that are teaching is that the stress and anxiety levels uh, of uh, students at Kansai Gaidai and other places. I'm actually I'm teaching a course at the University of Hawaii right now. And I, I kind of get a similar sense uh, from the students that uh, because of the pandemic, the uh, anxiety levels uh, have been going up and the demand for mental health ser services are, are going up. So that's what prompted this in my mind. But let's uh, start, Reggie, uh, with looking at the state of mental health in Japan, I always, I, I remember when I was a student at Kansai Gaidai, um, there was a session Byoen, a, a, a hospital for uh, mental people, and it looked basically like a prison. You know, I would ride my bike past it every day, and I, I realized, and this is a while ago, that uh, Japanese people, when they look at mental health issues, they, they kind of tend to want to pretend like it doesn't exist. So I think Japan's come a long way from them, but Reggie, what would be your assessment of how mental health is perceived in this country and how it's addressed? Well, the basic thing that I would start with is that um, mental health is something that's part of daily life. It is everywhere. Um, but there's a, there's a kind of a, uh, how do I say, a split between daily mental health and mental health problems. And with mental health problems, they, the, the, there's basically three ways that you deal with mental health problems. You talk with friends and, or whatever, family members, however, and, you know, the kind of uh, normal ways that people do it everywhere. You go to a psychiatrist or you go to an institution. And clinical psychotherapy, the kind of work that I do, is not popular and there's a big stigma with it so wow. an there's an example of this is when i first started i was i didn't know about japanese attitudes towards um, counseling mental health um a client of mine told her boss that she was seeing me and after that her boss it was just a steady stream of comments like oh you don't understand that well that's because you're mental that she had to deal with and this is the attitude, basically, that, that this kind of in-between ground that I work in is between people have problems, but their regular social network is not enough, but they're not, they're people in daily life that are dealing with daily life problems like the pandemic. It doesn't mean that they need to be institutionalized or it doesn't mean that they need medication. Um, so this is, this is where the, this is where the big, the stigma and the gap is in uh, Japanese mental health. Have you thought uh, as to why that is? Uh, you know, in many 
as Americans living in Japan, we see some of our social trends echoed in this country along different lines and so forth. But it seems like the, uh, the awareness or the acceptance of uh, mental health as a part of your overall general well-being Mm -hmm. in the United States has not really translated into this country so as of many other aspects of not just American culture, but foreign culture right. that we see every day here. So why do you think there's been this resistance or reluctance on this particular topic? Well, it's as in with all kinds of things like this, it has to do with cultural values and, and cultural attitudes. Um, there's a lot of factors. I mean, one one factor I think is that the private self, your inner self, is is very much considered. Um, uh, how do I say? It's personal, and it's private, and people don't talk about it. They don't share it, even even in uh, regular daily life, um, in family life, and so on. Um, you notice that I look out the window at my neighbors, and the windows are all this kind of frosted glass windows, and this is very common that they have this kind of you know this division between the inner and the outer. And um, and this is the I mean this is just one attitude. Um, I think another thing is that when you do have problems, the way they deal with it is not in, in, in Japanese society is not so much in terms of interpersonal dialogue is not the way that things work around here. Things get you are told what to do. It works on a basis of this the uh, uh, the function of the of society it works in a hierarchical basis rather than an equality basis as in the US mm -hmm. and so people are told what to do the educational system is based on rote learning um, it's not based on a dialogue between the teacher and the student um, so and if an example of this is the Japanese word hansei which means self reflection but it's self-reflection, but the way they do this kind of self-reflection, Hansei is a particular kind, it's when you, you, it's used when you've made a mistake, you've done something bad. You go off and you reflect by yourself. And then you make a report back to the teacher or the boss, as it happened to me one time, um, when I uh, uh, slept through, a, no, I was sent to an appointment out somewhere and I slept through on the train. I slept through my stop on the train and I woke up way down the line. So I had to go back. I was late for the uh, appointment. And afterwards, the company asked me to write a Hansei letter, a Hansei Bun in Japanese, which means a self-reflection letter on how I was going to improve my behavior and make sure that this didn't happen again in the future. Mm. So wow, it's, right. it's, it's individual. It doesn't happen in dialogue. That's the point. I it doesn't see. happen. And, the, and so you have this, the, the culture is that when you, a lot of the treatments that they have for people now that they developed, they, they've become very good in Japan on dealing with emergencies in their own way. You know, suicide, uh, depression, but, uh, but the kind of uh, uh, anxiety issues and stuff, but the kind of ways that they deal with it are one thing is, is you might call it the rest cure. And this is a traditional kind of therapy in Japan, but you stay, like if you have depression, the government has allowed companies to, or mandated companies in some cases, to give people time off when they have depression. And, you know, three months, six months is not uncommon, right? For a person to get leave from their job. But what do they do during the six months? They don't do counseling. They just take a rest. And mm -hmm. then when they've recovered their feeling, then they go back to the job and then back into the same situation they were in and nothing's changed. So this is a kind of, this is kind of the, this is, this is the cultural way of doing, dealing with these kinds of things. Yeah, wow. Now we, we both teach about culture, uh, each in our own domain. And uh, mm. I'm, I, even though I've been doing it for so many years, it's just, I'm always amazed how deep culture influences behavior. Indeed. And what, you, what you just described to me, if, if we had a mental health professional listening to this from the United States or some other Europe or right. South America, they would go, that's ridiculous. How can someone right. fix himself? 
or herself by, by just self-reflection, just take a break and come back to the exact same conditions. Clearly the problem will repeat again. But anyway, within the Japanese context, that's the solution that's been created and, and wow. See, there are, other, there are other aspects too, you know, the idea of maturity in Japan. The idea of maturity in Japan is based on the idea of being able to, um, how do I say, deal with a situation gracefully without, it's basically enduring, without causing problems. This is the idea of, a, this is a, I, the ideal of maturity. So um, there's a Japanese word, reisei, which means kind of cool-hearted or cool-headed. You don't mm -hmm. let your emotions get to you, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is, so instead of like dialogue, right? You have these kinds of, uh, you, you kind of deal with it on yourself and you, you try to, you know, you end up with these values of like acceptance of the problem, acceptance of the situation, um, mm -hmm. not causing waves, not causing the idea of not causing problems for other people. Mm. Uh, these are all uh, these kinds of attitudes are what's are inter it's all interwoven in these kinds of ways. It's kind of ironic, Reggie, isn't it, that uh, the sense of community and mm. not not placing a burden on others, which Japanese right. people are taught from day one, basically, and it's built into the language as well, um, places this burden on the individual. It is well, really, really deep. You know? so it's like a, there's I, a sense of community, but really, in, when it comes to this, people are forced to kind of make do on their own. Uh, one time, a, a friend of mine was talking about how he was talking with a Japanese man, a friend, a Japanese friend of his, and his friend said, I think Japan is very proud of the fact that Japan is a harm, harmonious culture. Mm -hmm. And his response was, it's not harmony, it's coercion. <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's the difference you know that's the difference between the the when people how do i say go along with the established order there's, there's very much a sense in japan that you can't you can't uh, change the established order is just a, a given mm -hmm. you know sort of like an existential given in life you can't change it you just have to so this is one of the explanations for why Hikikomori, which is the, the idea of being a shut-in, you, you, people retreat from the world when they have problems. Right, yeah, I didn't think to address as as an, as an issue, but that's certainly an aspect of mm. Japanese mental health, which is uh, a severe challenge. And actually the government is trying to directly face that. And we, right. we, we, have, uh, we have a colleague whose daughter uh, went through this and eventually died of starvation. It's quite sad. Well, I know. I know. Yeah, I've heard. This anyway, Reggie, let, let me okay. let me. Has you've been here in Japan a long time as I have? It, it sounds like things aren't changing all that much from when I was looking at the psychology hospital and the situation today, but. Um, we do have Naomi Osaka just recently, who is revered right. in this country uh, as you know, a very famous and successful tennis player who uh, withdrew from a recent tennis tournament for mental health reasons. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was unbelievable news. Do you think that those types of things would maybe on the edges uh, change the perception about how people deal with these problems? Because she, to her credit, was very open about it. I'm sure there have been tennis players or other professionals in the past that have had similar issues, but they didn't bring it up publicly. And then recently there was an American athlete at the Olympics who also withdrew from events because of mental health. So there's a uh, Japanese American and then an American that are doing this. Do you think that this will have a positive impact in terms of how people perceive mental health? That it'll become- Gradually, gradually, gradually. It's a okay. slow process. It's a slow process. Okay. so. All right, <laughs> so we have to be patient on that if we expect that to grow. Well, as, now, I, as I said, I said they're very good with the, they, they have centers now for domestic violence. They've, they've all these governing initiatives to, that's a big reason why, part of the reason why the suicide rate has declined since 2003, mm. 2003 in Japan until recently. 
Um, depression is being treated now. There are ways that they're doing it, but they're still kind of doing it in their own way, which is only natural. You know, so. Okay. Yeah, that, that brings up, that's a nice segue to my next question, Reggie, and that's uh, mm. the recent rise in the suicide rate in Japan. The government okay. uh, for many years has been attempting to try and bring that number down, and they have been successful, as you pointed out. But unfortunately, uh, as we were talking before the show, starting in July, that number now is going up. So the number for 2020 was a rise in the uh, suicide rate of 3.7%. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I, teaching uh, my students, uh, you can feel a sense of anxiety in them, mm -hmm. the things they write about, the things they talk about, and oftentimes they, they uh, just disappear from my class. And sometimes they'll tell me that they need to take this mental vacation that you were talking about. They're, they're actually doing the same thing. Have you noticed that uh, in your practice? Are, are you more busy now than you were perhaps a year or two years ago? I am definitely more busy. Yeah, it's definitely the, uh, um, the impact. Well, it's part of the reason it's, it's, it's a lot of it's connected to the, to the pandemic. Um, but part of the reason that I'm busier is because of the rise in mental health issues connected to the pandemic. But the other part of the reason is because of the acceptance and the use of, of these kinds of things like Zoom and internet technology, it's much more common now. And so people, in, uh, uh, it, make, it's, it makes it more accessible. And in particularly in Japan where um, there might not be a therapist next door as they might easily defined in the US, people are more spread out. And so because of the, uh, the use of uh, teletherapy, um, that's, which is also connected to the pandemic because of it's, it's been so much, so many things have gone online. So that's part of the reason too. So you're, you're uh, as a practicing psychotherapist, your reach has increased because patients can contact you through Zoom and do you find that Zoom sessions are as effective or as normal face-to-face? -face? They're effective. It's, 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 I still prefer in person. You know, there's there's the nonverbal and the uh, you know these the the kind of the the visceral feeling of being in the same room together and and uh, these kinds of things. I think it's still um, preferable, but I teletherapy is is effective. There's uh, and there's been plenty of research that, that demonstrates this. So. Okay, and uh, getting back to the suicide uh, rates, you had told me before we started the show that the uh, biggest increase there is with young people. You said under the right. age of eighteen, uh, that has been the segment that has unfortunately grown the most. Uh, uh, do you also attribute that to the pandemic? Even for these younger that's part, people, that's part part of the part of it is the is the pandemic. Yes, it's the 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 pressures that have uh, have increased on students, um, particularly in Japan. The people that have had the hardest time with the pandemic are the people that are on the, the how do we say the edges of society, mm -hmm. like children. You know, students are not part of the. I mean, they're part of the society. It's not like they're on the edge of society, but in terms of the power structure of society, they're on the edge. Mm -hmm. um, and they, so the rates that have gone up in Japan um, have been with the difficulties have been the, the percentage of people who've had the most difficulties are with young people, um, women, both in terms of housewives because they're at home or their husbands are at home. So the domestic violence rates have gone up um, because they're spending more time together and with frustration, with greater frustrations. Um, and uh, the social isolation factors, uh, not being able to uh, meet with people as easily as before. And, uh, and also the other part of, of women that is affected is the women who are single mothers or single, um, adults, and uh, they tend to have a higher percentage of part-time workers, mm -hmm, women right. who are part-time workers. Same with the young, the the younger uh, uh, people, um, uh, people under forty have had a hard time. There's been 
what did I read? It's like 40% of people under 40 haven't been able to find a, um, a, a full-time job. And they, so they end up with these part-time jobs and they're the first person to get laid off and their difficulties. So this has affected uh, uh, single mothers and uh, single uh, women adults, and also in general, um, the younger people and then the students. So those are the people, the groups of people that have been affected by the uh, pandemic the most. Uh, um, and, I, and also the, uh, of course, the elderly people um, because of the social isolation factor. Wow, it's a, it's a complex and a challenging issue. I think, uh, yeah, it makes sense to me as a management professor coming from the kind of the business or econ side of things that if you put pressure on single working women or other families that are not getting by or students mm -hmm. who have graduated, as you said, who cannot find full-time jobs, uh, most of my students, uh, at Kansai Gaidai, they lost all of their part-time jobs because basically the restaurants closed. That's majority of them work in some kind of food service. So that put economic pressure on them in addition to the social pressure and isolation. It's, mm -hmm. it's a tough situation. Uh, it is for, a tough situation. Yeah. So Reggie, one other thing I wanted to address, uh, you, you're uh, focused on cross-cultural psychology. As I recall, your, your thesis was on that, right? That's right. And you, you practice that yourself. Um, have you also, this growth in your activity, is it coming from uh, mixed marriages? Uh, are they, those couples also experiencing greater stress? They are the experiencing greater stress. Um, so they're not, they're not outside of this then. They're, I, I guess everybody's experiencing greater stress. Maybe that's right. Some more that's than right. I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's a particular, uh, um, it's just, it's the same kind of, basically, as I mentioned before, with the domestic violence rates going up um, because of couples, uh, different reasons having stress, either financial in terms of losing the job or being at home together more because the um, one person is working at, at home now on the internet instead of going into the office. Um, those, are the, those are the two of the main uh, situations that have uh, um, affected couples. So. Yeah, I think historically uh, the divorce rate for uh, mixed uh, ethnic or mi mixed nationality couples in Japan is higher, although that may be influenced by the military because lots of marriages occur out of that and uh, the divorce rate there is quite high uh, but uh, I don't know is that correct Reggie that's my my perception you well, agree my, with that? My, what, I, what I was told by once by the people at the American Embassy when I had a meeting in Osaka at the American American Embassy they said that the divorce rate in Japan with with mixed marriages it's it's higher than the Japanese rate but lower than the American rate okay <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of meets right in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But that when when you have that situation in your private practice, as you were talking about earlier, uh, the psychological approach to mental health is so different across the Japanese culture and foreign cultures. I guess we're both familiar with American cultures. How do you navigate that when you recognize that you can say one thing and it will be understood this way by the American partner and a different way by the Japanese partner or this way for the Italian partner and this way for the Korean partner, if you have those kinds of mixed couples as well. I mean, psychotherapy is so difficult to do. I just can't imagine how you do that when you have two different cultures in the mix. Well, it, it, it's, like, it's like adding a whole nother variable into the mix of things that you have just because you've got two people yeah. uh, interacting. So it, it adds a whole nother level of, of complexity to an already complex situation. Yeah. Uh, and part of what happens with cultural stuff is that people aren't aware of it. People don't think about it so much. I mean, some things are obvious and people pick up on it, but a lot of other things so one of the things that I do when I'm working with couples is when I hear something that has a cultural connection, I point it out. 
And so it's it's a um, it's basically uh, it, the the phrase that I use with people is that the basic approach to cross cultural understanding and cross cultural difficulties is the first thing you need to do is to separate observation and interpretation. People tend to observe and 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 interpret things together. That's the normal way of functioning. And but in uh, when you have a cross cultural situation, the possibility of cultural things going on that you don't understand, you first need to observe what's going on, get information, and then decide what to do with it. Just decide, interpret it, and so on. Um, so it's a it's basically a education, mm. but it if you know it affects things like communication styles are are one way that it definitely cultural um, uh, influence that people are un tend to be unaware of, affection. How to communicate affection to other people is very, is very cultural. Um, uh, problem solving is also, a, a, has, cultural, is, has cultural influences when there are problems that happen. How do you deal with the problems? And uh, stress, just general stress, how you deal with stress um, is very cultural. For, so for example, as I mentioned before, the Japanese tend to deal with stress by enduring it and trying to, uh, um, this, this is the value, um, but that's not the way that a lot of people deal with stress. Mm. And uh, so, um, so these, are, these are kind of uh, um, uh, things that I work with when I'm you know, working. Not an easy job, Reggie. That's what makes it fun. <laughs> I see. Yeah, and you can do so much good, I think, as well. Hey, we're running out of time, Reggie. The time flew by so quickly. If anybody is interested in contacting you regarding your practice or some of the research that you're doing on cross-cultural psychology, what would be the best way to do that? You just go to my website, which is www.reggiepaul.net. Sorry. So it's, uh, and my name P, my Reggie, my first name, and my last name, P-A-W-L-E. And on the website, there's a contact information uh, button, and they can contact me through that. Okay. Reggie, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your insight mm. into this uh, very, very interesting issue. Yeah, so, I'll, um, yeah, so the viewers, I'll, I'll see you again down the road. We'll address another issue relating to Japan or Asia. So thank you so much for tuning in appreciate it if you have comments about the show uh, please provide them to think tech hawaii really appreciate it so we'll see you again Thank, thanks again reggie bye bye bye